Hello, my name is Roger Doudna, and it's my great pleasure today to introduce you to Joy Drake. Joy uh, joined the community uh, and was actually present when I arrived here 42 years ago, although she subsequently left and spent the, much of the next, much of her life actually in the United States. When did, Joy, welcome, when did you come yourself? When were you, when did you arrive? What was your time like? I came in 71 and I feel like um, I was going on holiday with my boyfriend and we had a plan laid out. We were in little Dercheveau Citroen and it felt like um, Fintorn or God or my soul had a piece of string on the front bumper and just pump, bumped us straight up here so we didn't go on the other holiday that we were doing. We came straight to Fintorn and um, so I arrived in 71 and uh, I left at the end of 85, having gone through an entire lifetime here. I got married here, I had a child here, the child died here, I had a funeral here, and I got divorced here. All within that span of time. So that's what I mean, I stumbled, bumbled and fumbled my way through a lifetime here. I came, that was the time I woke up to who I truly am. Um, well, that's debatable still, I'm still waking up to that. Um, and it's my home. I don't know that I ever really left. I mean, I think perhaps it's fair to say that you are best known as being the creator of the, uh, the game, the game of life, the game yes. of transformation. You helped, you played, uh, you organized played. a college class <laughs> <laughs> in the evenings. I thought it was a good teaching tool. I still think it's probably the best teaching tool we have. How did it happen? I don't know that there's a short answer to that question. How did it really happen? I think my first introduction to spiritual life was in the 60s with Theosophy and Alice Bailey. Mm. And there's a very popular phrase in all her writings, soul-infused personality. Mm. And that intrigued me. And, I, and that started my quest. And in a short answer, that's what led to the game of transformation really. My desire, what is a soul-infused personality? How do you know when your soul is in, what, how do soul-infused personalities look any different to ordinary personalities that are illumined? What does that phrase mean? And it felt like a little prayer going up and my soul, my life saying to me, all right, we'll show you, we'll teach you about it and you can help others learn about it. So that's my big quest. So yes, I came here, I was, did all sorts of, um, you know, cleaning jobs, macrame, and, and then core group, and personnel, and the dining room, and all that stuff. Um, and I think it was in personnel where you interview people. We were always looking for ways of kind of refining how we assess in those days who comes into the community and who goes out. And at an interview, you're on your best behavior. As the interviewer, you're looking for the best in the person and the interviewee wants to present the best side. So sometimes it's not very clear, you know, you make a wrong impression of a person. What, how can we, um, what can we do to clarify that? And I think all that combined with, um, I don't know, it was just two years of uh, getting uh, poems in Sanctuary, which led to the Insight and Setback cards. It took 18 months to two years before anything was put down. And then it was mainly an argument the whole time. I would say to spirit, I'm ordinary. I'm really ordinary. I'm not gifted. I don't see round corners. I'm not very smart. I'm very, um, there's nothing special about me. You've picked the wrong person. 
if you want sacred geometry and you want certain icons and you want it to reflect certain esoteric principles, why don't you pick someone who knows about these things, can just go up a mountain, take a reporter's notebook, take, um, you know, and shorthand, write it down and come back and do it. It will be a lot simpler for you. You've got the wrong person. It ain't me, babe. And uh, that went on for two, for two years. But no one emerged from the community or Kazakhstan. I mean, this is the early 70s. I remember you coined a phrase in 75, come alive in 75. I'm sure that's your phrase from standing up in the CC. And um, that's when it all started happening. Well, the remarkable thing about the game to me yes. is that it seems to be a kind of a distillation, a condensation um, of the Finthorn experience. It is. The Finthorn experience that, men, that we were having at that time. I agree. And it's 40 years later, and it's not only integrated into the fabric of the community, but it's still being played um, by people who really don't know squat about Fintorn and would not come to Scotland, but um, enjoy playing the transformation game. Well, as I understand it, you took the game to America and you played it with people there who um, seemed to get Fintorn primarily by playing the game. Yes. You also, I think, ad adapted it for use in corporate settings. Yes. How do you, tell us the story about that. How did that all happen? And, how, and what was the effect of it, you think? Um, well, this is a while ago since I did that, so I'm just pulling out my memories of that. People play the games in all sorts of settings, Roger. They play them uh, with uh, um, teams and departments, in banks, in insurance companies, in whatever. And then occasionally... In corporate settings or it, privately? In corporate settings, and people would find they would come up against hurdles. For me, um, when I started test um, playing, the um, a more of a business version, I went to Boeing in um, Seattle. And I remember doing a game there and someone picked um, a setback uh, card from the game, early on in the game, there was a department sitting there. And I asked a question, can you, can you connect with this card or something? And she said, if I thought this was therapy, I wouldn't have come here. I don't want to talk about this. That was my wake up. We can't do physical, emotional, mental, spiritual levels in a corporate setting. It's too disclosing. It's too personal. It's not appropriate. And so people, the players themselves, taught me, so I think it's individual, team, organizational, and global. Those are the settings in Frameworks for Change. And um, so also angels. Um, have connotations for people uh, which may not be helpful and we replace those with mentors, some of which are the same qualities as angels, as the angel cards, but many of which aren't. And that kind of service, um, human, this is about being fully human, not transcending anything. That's what the game does. It's about deeply incarnating and somehow accepting what life gives us with all its ups and downs. And um, somehow within that, carrying sacred space in us and around us with our life experience. I love that life experience is the fifth element. Earth, air, fire, water, ether, I think experience. Is, is the fifth element. So experience really molded frameworks for change. And then we also discovered that that takes time to play in a department. So now we do the frameworks coaching process, which is a lot shorter, enables coaches and group leaders to offer a mini frameworks experience to people. Just kind of your sense of what, you, what impact that had upon institutional settings. You know, when the foundation or NFA or the community plays the game, it brings things to the surface. Mm. Gifts 
overlooked, uh, challenges need to be acknowledged, and so it kind of up levels what's going on. It brings a lot, it illuminates. And um, it did exactly the same in corporate settings. So it would really depend on who was participating, if it was inter-team uh, participating or the CEOs and then a lower group of workers, you know, issues about authority, issues about status, just the issues come up. So it's difficult to give just a general right. answer. So it kind of brings issues that are in the field up Absolutely. for consideration and yes. um, treatment, shall yes. we say. Yes. So most of the places that we got hired to do, we would have advocates in that group where we would have allies where some of the CEOs or some of the managers had played the game of transformation or the box game and weren't skeptical about it and were gung-ho about it and wanted to bring it to their teams and departments. Well, uh, I want to move on, but, but yes. I also want, before we move on, I wanted to just to say that um, the game has an almost unerring ability yeah. to function pretty much like an oracle in the yeah. sense of um, providing guidance or direction or sense of direction uh, to the players in but well, regardless of whatever situation it's being played in I I certainly that's I mean I've noticed that repeatedly here in the community we play it whether it's in, in small groups or whether we play it in big groups in the hall um, this has this oracular quality do you have any sense about how that happens what the dynamics are? I, I do and I don't, Roger. Um, I think the game is alive and fresh and in, in the moment and spontaneous and exactly what you said, it meets people where they're at without judgment. It meets them in with clarity and compassion wherever they're at. And <clears throat> that's because of the deva of the game, the planetary beings, beings of initiatory interest, who take interest in this, and, and they enliven the game. They, they vitalize it, they replenish it. The game has grown in power because we appreciate and work with the subtle worlds. And because, because we do, they respond and it, it, the game is so much more powerful now than it was 40 years ago. And I think you can train people down here to actually do the rules and f facilitate, but the inspirational flow, the creativity, the flexibility, the miracles, it's like breath in a way, when if you are not breathing deep enough, you know, you take a breath and it gives you more oxygen. If you're hyperventilating, your breath slows you down. It's the great leveler. I think the, the, the subtle worlds do that with the game. And to me, that's what makes it special. It's just plastic and paper and wood and everything. It's more than synchronicity. It's more than coincidence. It's more than prayer. It's more than intention. I don't know what it is. Well, it's ritual, certainly. It is ritual and... It's an initiatory ritual, so it is. It, is. it takes people from A to M, at least. It may not be A to Z. And it does it in a scenic route so that people have to stretch awareness, acceptance, action. So we talked about love in action as one of the principles and the game is love in action, love in expression. It's just what it is because it expands people's awareness. It says embrace and accept your experience, put it into action. Look at where you spend your attention. Look at where you spend your day. You want to know what you're committed to? You want to know what you believe in? Look at all that. 
because where you put your attention and what you do during the day, that's what you're really committed to. Do you see Fintorn as being an expression of love and action? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I think it's one of the, you know, you, it is a beacon of hope and light. And yes, and, and it's made up of human beings. But like our monasteries love in action, our convents love in action, our ashrams love in action, Fintorn is all those things. And it's made up of individuals, but we're all aspiring to let the heart lead. There is too much mind for all of us on the planet. So we all are wanting to come down into the body, into the heart, and let the innate healing and compassion and kindness of the heart direct everything. I think that's the whole, um, you know, marriage of sacred masculine and sacred feminine that we talk about this is the time of the sacred feminine just kindness to oneself and gentleness as a way rather than and it's changing how the government happens and everything happens or not things are falling apart and things are coming together but yes I do I do think this is a place of love in action it brings out the love in me when I come it brings out the love in the guests. It brings out the love in old friends. And um, you know that paper of uh, David wrote? Spangler. David Spangler, Fintorn, question mark, and whatever, garden or jungle, because it feeds all the flowers and it feeds all the weeds. That's what I love about the game. It doesn't exile anyone or anything and says, come into the light. Michael alluded to this the other night. Michael Linfield. Yes, Michael Linfield. But you know, when I started this, there were two games uh, that I created. Um, the, the journey of a soul-infused personality. To go through these levels and somehow come to cohesion or coherence. And then when you've done that, game two, so what do soul-infused personalities do? What do enlightened people do? So here, 40 years later, I, you, we, them, us, life, we're still working on the first game. So my, I, my endeavor, my intention is to let life lead me and I live my game as if it's a I live my life as if it's a game. There isn't any on or off switch for me. You live your life as if it's a game. Yes. Your game. No, not my game, the game where I take what I've learnt from the game and um, each square, service, appreciation, insight, setback, I am, I'm aware when I'm on it. Mm. I'm aware of the importance of it. I haven't just done this for 40 years. I don't want something where I've seen it all. I've seen all the cards. I wrote all the cards. I've heard all the answers to the cards. I know how to fix anything. But this isn't about fixing. I want to be spontaneous. I want to be in the moment. I want to be in the present. And I want to allow the emerging impulse. That's what the big, the most recent change for me came from the planetary game we played in June of 2012. And in that experience... You were at Fintorn? Yes, I don't know if you were there. I don't know either. Um, but um, I had an experience for the first time in a long time of being a player. And that has changed my life. Uh, in the last few years dramatically and um, it was it felt like a divine intervention for me a gift back from the game had a hundred people my name was pulled out of the hat to be a player and 
that was a real shock. I had to take off my God robe and my facilitation hat and I had to go into humanity and play the game in front of every, be, just be one of the players. Mm -hmm. And in that experience, I experienced a wild magic, I don't know how else to say it, that I call the emerging impulse, which subsequently we're calling the emerging future. But that's what I'm committed to at the moment. What is the impulse that's trying to come through? How can I nourish that? How can I give it space? Let me follow, let me follow that. And it's wild. You can't go into the wild and when you're looking for a, a deer or something, go, come on, I'm here. I'm ready. Come out wherever you are. And sometimes I think we crash into the subtle world and say, give me guidance or give me answers to this. And it's a lot of patience and discipline and sitting quietly and allowing oneself to be touched. So I've slowed down a lot in the last four years and just want to let the emerging impulse lead. It is anyway, but you know, I'm so British. I'm so self-controlled. I'm so tidy. So I'm trying to allow more messes in my life, more unfinished, uh, things that I don't know the answers to and go into new areas. Let the emerging impulse lead. What do you feel Finthorn's role or contribution to the larger world actually is? Oh, I really, I know I sound like a, a record, but I echo what, what you've been saying and Michael Linfield has said and, and Eileen Caddy said, it really is a beacon of hope and inspiration. I mean, People who know I'm at Fintorn, they, they look to it to, I don't know, it just is such a, a place of possibility and stepping into potential. You know, there's two doors we all have in life. Door A, same old, same old. Door B, something different. We're going in door B. The only ruts we get in are when we keep, we want to stay it safe here. And there's most people and the Fintorn angel itself is alive and it has that emerging impulse. It has that, <coughs> we're being blessed. So if, we, if it can be done anywhere, it can be done here. And if anyone can do it, you can. And if anyone can do it, I can. And so can Thomas, and so can everyone here. It isn't special people anymore. We really are the group body of the sacred. And Fintorn desires that, wants to emulate that, believes in that. We're all working on it. Ain't perfect. Well, it's delightful to hear you say that, Joy. It's delightful to anticipate your return. Hey, thank anyway, you. Anyway, it's delightful Rob. to chat with you today. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you.